I V M. This episode is powered by Storytel.in, and the book I'm recommending this week is To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. It won the Pulitzer Prize and has now become one of the best references to classic modern American literature. Guys, you should definitely check out this book. The characters and story have been lightly influenced by the author's own childhood observations and memories of her neighborhood and family in Monroeville, Alabama. Use the Storytel.com/ivm link to get a 30-day free trial, as opposed to just a 14-day trial. You've tuned into a show called Mr and Mrs Binge Watch and you were expecting a spoiler free episode so there are many many spoilers on this episode kripya dhyan dijiye Easy peasy viewing now these are shows that are easy to get into their stories are either universal or simple enough for everyone to follow they often make us smile and their episodes rarely take up more than 20 to 30 minutes at a time hello and welcome you're listening to mr and mrs binge watch i'm janice sequera with me is my mr anirudh guha and if that long introduction didn't already tell you today mr guha and i are going to talk about shows that are easy to watch easy to fall in love with and surprisingly netflix is easy did not make the cut <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, Guhav? I mean, there was that a good intro, or what? I'm getting really good amazing. at this. Yeah, you've always been great at this kind of things, Janis. But you're like the podcast senior, no? I, I wish sometimes <laughs> I wake up in the morning or like I go to work and you're there before me to introduce me before I enter a meeting. <laughs> wow. Okay. Now you're making me sound like a PR agent. But but okay. Before we get into today's themes and we talk about which shows we're going to discuss and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, let's talk about what you and I are watching right now. So the show that Guhav and I just are watching last night. In fact, it's been out for. about a week is of course Jessica Jones uh, where how many episodes in four four episodes new season season 3 and of course uh, the final season all Jessica Jones fans holding on to their hearts and saying please give her a good goodbye the final season of Netflix's entire Marvel catalog in fact yeah i mean in your near future guha and i are going to do an episode about that so marvel fans please stay tuned the other show that of course i've just started sampling is uh, deepa mehta's leela i'm about 3 episodes in it's about a dystopian future and the cast of course is led by the wonderful huma qureshi and siddharth uh, it's pretty bleak right now in terms of the universe that it's been creating but uh, you know i'm i'm curious about where the story ends up and 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 of course the show that we are really really hooked on to and looking forward to every week is is big little lies of course uh three episodes of which are out so far but before we talk about big little lies a little janice there's another show that i'm just cannot wait to start is uh, is the german show dark which mm. is back with the second season on netflix correct this is the show that uh, i mean you were absolutely gave you nightmares in love. and which i absolutely crazily fell in love with and you know na i mean okay chalo i'll just admit it right dark really confused me really scared me and i remember that even before having to watch you know multiple episodes i would actually have to go and do a recap for almost every episode because it's constantly it is a complex yeah, show it's a very very complicated show in fact i have uh, not watched the show in over a year now so i have very little recollection of the exact plot line of the show but what i do remember what i do remember loving about dark was the fact that it uh, you know shifted genres so easily after mm. every episode you know you it starts off being the supernatural thriller then it's a time travel piece uh, at some point it's a superhero show it's just it's just a great great mix of so many different genres And uh, yeah, I'm really excited about season uh, two. If I can get some time off from watching India World Cup matches <laughs> on the weekend, then I might uh, actually watch it uh, soon. Actually, since we're talking about stuff that we're watching, I mean, Anirudh is not watching anything mostly these days purely because he's so hooked onto the World Cup. Our weekend plans have changed. Every time there's an India match, it's like calm, bhool jao, appointments, bhool jao, because our man here is hooked onto the World Cup. Ah, uh, more than anything else, all India matches are taking place mostly on the weekend, right? which is what we keep aside for our binge watching time so guys yeah it's becoming a little difficult to get new stuff for the next couple of weeks at least till the yeah, world cup yeah it's a ends. real challenge like right now we're like we're doing this podcast called mr and mrs binge watch so we have to also keep watching content but really cricket is taking up a lot of my husband's time in fact uh, ani i have to ask you right on the fly what did you think of all those memes and all those videos and india pakistan match ke baad all those very very beautiful tweets that came out from pakistan <laughs> So I for the first time in my life went out there and retweeted multiple responses from Pakistani fans on the night of the match because I remember the match ended and I think it was around 1:30 a.m. 
just before going to sleep i went to check some of the responses by pakistani fans and they huh. had me in splits <laughs> because that you know that uh, mixture of urdu punjabi language hmm. with them uh, lamenting the loss it just threw up so many gems and i've got to say this our pakistani counterparts are so much more sporting <laughs> about uh, losing losing. Uh, losing or winning you know i like the fact that there is a, a slightly less amount of jingoism involved and when their team loses they don't pull any punches but while doing that huh. they keep it funny it's not just venting it's not just anger it's using humor to express disappointment which i think is quite something my favorite video of course is that guy that's I mean, everybody's you, video that's everyone's video i mean if you since this is a mr and mrs binge watch reco uh, why don't you go on youtube and just type pakistani fans reacting to their loss against india because there's this one guy who's talking about wo burger kha rahe hai wo <laughs> pizza kha rahe hai but you know even that guy so obviously the uh, on the night of the match a 30 second clip of him lamenting about how the pakistani players went out <laughs> <laughs> eating fast food Wait, the, let me, let me give the night before the match Haan, correct. but uh, but but then when the longer video came out even in that while he is going after the uh, the men somebody asks him about sarfraz khan and makes this really insulting comment and he cuts that person down saying that listen i am not here to pull anybody down let's not insult our players i just want to express disappointment and i thought that was such a great statement to make that even a guy who is so damn upset about watching his team lose mm. knows that at the end of the day it doesn't help getting personal about any one player i mean we've had instances of uh, of of there being stone pelting and blackening of houses of superstars after they've lost matches of mm. course a lot of that happens in pakistan as well tvs get broken as we know but uh, i like the fact that you know they can take uh, loss in such a sporting fashion yeah you mean unlike in our country where they'll go and they'll throw keechad at someone's house they'll burn effigies everywhere the news will only no, focus like on that but like i said they do that in pakistan as well yeah but, but i mean i i've actually haven't seen i mean but i think pakistan twitter is way 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 more entertaining than india twitter yeah i mean at this point we're talking about cricket so much i mean uh, hey producer that is why don't you invite us on water player and edges and sledges yeah pimping are the ivm podcast right on top of the show there but 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 now we've spoken enough about world cup shall we move on to what yeah, else yeah, we're sure, watching sure sure the other show of course that you and i are watching and we're hooked on to every episode is big little lies uh, season 2 of the show is out and i remember we were discussing it before it came out and you were really apprehensive about the fact that does it even what are they going to do in season 2 No also because season 1 which was uh, you know touted to be a limited series hmm. uh, swept the limited series awards and they were all uh, you know every time anybody related to the show was questioned about it they were very adamant about the fact that a season 2 is unlikely right. because i mean they'd used up all the source material hmm. which is why when it was first announced it seemed like a bit of a you know cheap trick because it's gotten so popular for now for a studio yeah yeah, yeah, yeah to just you know sort of uh, bank on the first season's popularity and uh, you know just bang one in but uh, what i i'm really really surprised about and which i'm enjoying is that it's still pulling out all the punches i think uh, the season has been fantastic so far right. lian moriarty who wrote the original novel is back to write the storyline for mm. the new season as well so it's not like they're completely detaching themselves from the original source or the creator in in any form and sort of bastardizing her work. her work hmm. david e kelly is back to write all the episodes they of course have introduced meryl streep into an already formidable cast i think that's when the world was sold right i mean the day they announced that meryl streep is joining the cast of big little lies well like ha abhi tum kitne bhi seasons bana lo we are okay with it because yeah, meryl so streep I, is in yeah you're right so it had a bitter sweet kind of a thing about it oh they're coming back with a second season are they going to ruin the first one oh but they also have meryl streep in it so there's something to look forward to right. and from what we've seen so far is that they've been able to continue with the themes that made season 1 so spectacular hmm. 
Hmm. Uh, very comfortably. Yeah, I mean now finally all those secrets that they've been covering, all those secrets come out, and I also like the fact that they're not. Um, you know, they could have very easily gone straight to the tapes about what happened after they pushed uh, the husband down the stairs. Or, right. I'm Perry, forgetting Perry. Perry right. They pushed Perry down the stairs, but they're sort of unfolding it very, very slowly. They're first letting us get used to the fact that the five lead characters are back. That Meryl Streep is now part of this universe, and of course she's Nicole Kidman's mother-in-law and Perry's mother in who this wants series. to get down to the bottom yeah, of what happened to yeah who wants to understand to... what happened to her son and what are the circumstances under which he died but the way they're using the children the way they're using you know the secrets it's all sort of coming together almost in an incestuous crazy sort of universe that it seems like it's going to explode season 2 I mean episode 2 for example I was really like oh my god yeah and so of course 4 weeks down the line once the whole season is out and we watched all of it and if we feel that the new season of Big Little Lies, you know, sort of maintains consistency and is still as brilliant as it seems to be mm. after the first, nearly the first half has aired. We'll uh, go back, hopefully, to the show and maybe yeah, talk a little bit more in detail. But right now, I'd just like to say that given the fact that uh, abuse and assault was mm. such an integral part of season one mm. and the fact that the perpetrator of so-called assault died at the end of season one and was in, in a way the reason why the book ended, right? It was sort of vindication for those women hmm. who had either been subjugated or had certain feelings about it. What the new season is being able to do is to tell us that the trauma of assault does not end with the death of the perpetrator or with the stopping of the assault. The trauma sort of persists in the form of PTSD or memories or, you know, sort of manifests itself into different forms, which hmm. is what makes... Uh, what lies ahead on the season so much more interesting because I really want to see where they take all these uh, themes. You know, again, the thing about these kind of shows and when they touch upon these themes, it also makes us think about our own life, right? I mean, the idea that while a person is living, you know, they have all these characteristics, good and bad attached to them, but then they die. And then even the most horrible human being is Correct. suddenly sanctified. Right. Right. And how do you talk to your children about the fact that their father was not this good man that he is painted out to be. Right, right. How do you explain to a mother that your son was actually a monster, right. a wife beating monster? These are like I feel like Nicole Kidman's track, like it was in season one, is still the strongest track, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also what they're doing with the other Monterey Five. I mean, that's what the moms are called in this show. They're the Monterey Five. Great actors. They've sort of you know within by by episode two they've already set their tracks for this season. And uh, I know both Ani and I can't wait to see what happens with the rest of the show like he said if we love the final outcome we're probably going to come back and do another deep dive but on that note let's take a quick break on the other side we get into this week's theme what is that Ani? It's easy peasy viewing Alright see you on the other side Hey everybody welcome to another amazing week on the IVM Podcast Network you know what not just an amazing week this is going to be an amazing year we're looking forward to all the stuff that we're going to bring you in 2020 please remember to fill out our survey ivmpodcast.com slash survey that's going to really help us know what you guys want from us from 2020 as well right I mean like we'd really like to hear from you so please do fill out that survey it would be very helpful also would like to thank our sponsors on the network this week we have Intel Cambly and Storytel also, if you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's a week of milestones. We have a couple of milestones this week. Geek Fruit released the 300th episode this week. What a journey it's been. Join Tejas and Vinkar as they celebrate this milestone by talking about HBO's new hit show, Watchmen. Actually, surprisingly, at this point, Geek Fruit is the second oldest show on our network. So it's definitely a show if you haven't checked out, please do check out. Another milestone that we have is it's the 50th episode of our Kannada show, Thale Harate. So definitely do check that stuff out. And as for the rest of our regular programming, on Cyrus Says this week, Cyrus talks to actor Neil Bopalam. On IVM Likes, Abbas Alika, Ritika and Madhuri give their weekly recommendations, discuss their favorite short stories, and talk about our new storytelling show, Tapri Tales. On Golgappa, Tripti is joined by Nikhil Mahajan, a director who carved a niche in the industry through his film, Pune 52. He elaborates on the craft of storytelling and what goes into making films for a living. On GBCD, Farhad and Sunetra talk about their experiences of having lived in different cities. They share how different cities have had an impact on their queer identity. On Lit Nama, Lakshmi talks to Sonia Thomas about her work at BuzzFeed, the meme culture, internet as a space for women, TikTok videos, and digital literary trends. On Tapri Tales, Malri tells the story of a mother who tries to understand YouTube trends and garners a dream of having her own YouTube channel. 
And with that, let's get on with your show. And we're back with Mr. and Mrs. Binge Watch. Guha, what are we talking about today? Well, like you said in your lovely introduction, as you spoke about, we're doing easy PC viewing. And uh, easy PC viewing, I mean, I don't know why we came up with that uh, uh, tagline, the two of us. But I think what we meant was that unlike sitcoms in the early days, which were all supposed to be easy PC viewing, you could, you know, sit through an entire season of Friends or watch a quick episode of a Seinfeld. Easy PC viewing is more in the sense that a lot of creators now are being able to tell interesting stories whether they're dramedies or romantic comedies in a sort of 8 to 10 episode, 20 to 30 minute format, like you said. Mm. And it's essentially that, right? I mean, it's the kind of show that you could binge watch the entire season off in about four hours, or you could choose to choose to split those episodes over several days. You watch them during travels or, you know, over lunch breaks or whatever it is, however you feel like watching them. They are not... Uh, the kind of shows that weigh down upon you or burden you in any way where you're either afraid of spoilers or where you need to, you know, sort of soldier through it to finish them. They're the kind of shows that even if you take a little break from them, maybe because you're watching something else and come back to, Mm. they still remain as interesting. Mm. And I think by the very nature of that genre of storytelling, you need uh, uh, those stories to be, you know, simple. Very few Creators in the US tell simple stories in a manner as interesting as Judd Apatow. Hmm. You know, uh, the creator of a show like Freaks and Geeks back in the day, or the guy who directed comedies like The 40-Year-Old Virgin and Knocked Up. Judd Apatow has been extremely busy, or I should say active, Hmm. on the entire TV circuit since the entire TV boom took place. What he's doing is that he's associating with people with really interesting ideas. And he's either sort of co-creating with them or writing certain episodes along with those creators. Or he's sort of, you know, backing them up by producing their shows. So in fact, two of the shows that we'll be featuring in today's episode, Love and Crashing, are both shows that Judd Apatow is sort of associated with in some form or the other. Hmm. Love, of course, is a show that uh, Judd Apatow has co-created along with Leslie Arfin and Paul Rust. Paul Rust also plays one of the two leads on the show, Gus. 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 <laughs> and uh, he's cast against uh, Mickey Dobbs, who plays, uh, or rather Jillian Jacobs, who plays uh, Mickey on the show. Now, love by the very definition of its title is literally just that. If I have to describe you what the show is about, it's about two very different people hmm. getting to know each other. And every season, in every season, their relationship sort of evolves a slightly, you know, evolves a little bit more each time. Right. So it's really that I don't think it's a show that's weighed down by too much of plot. It Mm. really is a character driven show. Gus is essentially this nerd you know, who has sort of the gift of the gab. But he's socially awkward. He's socially awkward. And uh, I feel even Mickey, who is this sort of a hot chick, is also socially awkward. Right. Uh, Which is why when they meet uh, in the first episode of the show, even though they are extremely opposite in terms of personalities, they somehow click. Mm. And I remember you and me watching it in the early days and thinking... KR, you know, there is just no chemistry between the two of them. This is just not going to happen. <laughs> this relationship is never going to work out. They are forcing it. Hmm. But I think what they've been able to do beautifully over a period of three or four seasons, and actually Love is a show that gets better with each season, is that they've made their relationship extremely believable. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on the show, Janice? I don't know, see, over three seasons, it started off with two people who were really irritating, who looked like they're never going to get together. And who actually even audiences were like, please guys, don't end up together because tumhare bichare bachche, tumhare bichare friends, tumhare bichare family, you know, they listen to you guys bitch about each other and bitch about this relationship and just be like, done with it. But somehow, Mickey and Gus, over three seasons, convince us that they're able to sort of 
evolve and change and i hate this you know because sometimes it's like when you are in a relationship are you evolving or changing to suit the other person or are you just generally evolving right i mean we all see that in relationship where becoming a little bit more accommodating where becoming slightly more sensitive to the needs of the person where even maybe changing parts of our personality i mean gus gives up drinking alcohol because he's supporting mickey who's you know dealing with her multiple what are those steps called her, she's going to aa and she's doing the 12 steps so i feel like it's sad that the show had to come to an end but i think that they gave us a really good sort of send off we couldn't have asked more for you know more than for you know mickey and gus to finally end up together and i think that that finale that they did taking all their friends all the characters on the show that we love because it's not just gus and mickey that we love on the show right ani i mean we love the roommate she's cuckoo she's crazy and she's sweet as hell we love the guy that she's dating who's also gus's friend i mean he's this burly overprotective guy who's great in the kitchen all their little socially awkward friends so i feel like that finale where they bring the entire cast together to see Gus and Mickey finally get married and they're like is this a joke or is this really happening because we're still not like the audience convinced that you two should end up together but you know what Gus and Mickey are convinced and that's the finale that we get yeah and you know there's another Judd Apatow show like I mentioned at the beginning uh, Crashing which mm. also unfortunately ended after three seasons but here's what's interesting the difference between Love and Crashing is that the night Crashing ended So the third season of Crashing, the finale aired, hmm. uh, and HBO announced I think a few hours before or after that the show was coming to an end, hmm. and Twitter just blew up because fans of the show could were in disbelief that a show that had gotten to such a great point hmm. after three seasons hmm. uh, was coming to an end, and Pete Holmes, the creator of the show, put out this really funny tweet. saying that while they were shooting uh, the last day huh. uh, and they were wrapping up shoot one of the guys on the set accidentally said that it was a show wrap instead of saying it was a season wrap <laughs> and it turned into a joke on set about how he was probably predicting doomsday which ended up being true but unlike love mm. which i feel had a pretty nice close ended kind of an existence yeah they went through all the motions where i feel uh, you know i mean while i would not have minded another season or another chapter in the lives of uh, gus and mickey we don't really know if it would have gotten repetitive after a point Yeah. But crashing, hmm. uh, but which is which is which the story of which we'll get into uh, in a while, uh, was a show that actually got better with each season, hmm. and I felt really peaked in season three. So there are two ways to look at it, right? It's kind of bittersweet because on one in in one uh, in one way to look at it is that the show is kind of. you know sort of saying goodbye on a high hmm. and the other is that hey was there more these characters could have done see i don't know i think i disagree with you over there because what has pete homes done over three seasons right? what has his character done he's gone from being this guy who's been kicked out by his wife who's cheating on him and being homeless so pretty much the entire first season is him crashing on many many you know comedians and friends is couches in the second season is when he sort of becomes the second like the opener right he's the guy who's opening on tv shows and warming up the crowds he's the guy who's opening for other famous comedians and you know actually sort of again there to warming up the crowds and in season 3 is when pete homes really comes into his own you know he wins that uh, stand up duel and you know sort of really shines as a comedian he's traveling across the country he's going to colleges he's going to universities he's getting his own opening spots at multiple clubs so i feel like what more could they have shown because i also really want to ask you right even when we're looking at comedy in the indian scene once a comedian has come into his own what is the next step like what is the evolution of the comedian that you can show me that will now blow my mind and be like oh that's what you wanted to do in your new season so what else could they have no, done with no but Pete i Holmes? think that's a very hypothetical conversation it's a kind of conversation you can only start having when you feel like the show has now begun to stink my point is entirely different from what you're trying to say i agree with you in terms of his career graph on the show itself as a character uh, he does go places but there is no uh, i mean there's no saying that he could have ga- gone 
even further ahead. Right. I mean, you're literally. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not are, disputing uh, that. I'm just saying that in terms of surprising the audience with, like, you know, I'm seeing you've seen this guy as a loser in season one. Season two, he's finally finding his footing. He's now opening and he's sort of being that guy who's figuring out his comedy. Season three, may he's figured it out. You know that now. Chances are there are only good things in store for Pete Holmes as a character. Sure, but I think uh, a very basic nature of easy peasy viewing shows is that they aren't exactly close ended. Hmm. So you're right. So Crashing began with a very serious, a very single, simple idea, which is that a stand up comedian who has no place to stay is crashing at different comedians' hmm. houses. Now, as we see in a lot of shows which begin with a certain idea, hmm. like for example, uh, say How I Met Your Mother, which began with the fact that the kids were obsessed to know uh, who their mother was. Right. But while that becomes a very interesting sort of way to get audiences into a story, hmm. you don't necessarily need to stick to that. And then the show sort of takes a life of its own. Correct. Uh, Friends, you could say was about Rachel coming in and, you know, sort of finding a foothold among five other individuals who were pretty well established. But obviously, that was just really a starting off point for them to then delve into deeper, you know, storylines. And also what happens with a lot of such shows is that characters evolve, they change, unlike with drama series, where they need to be very clearly defined, because they are performing the function of telling the story. Hmm. Comedies in general, you know, uh, they get better over a period of, a period of time or they get worse. And I felt Crashing was a show that was getting better. And I'm not talking from the point of view of uh, just where the plot was going or any of that. Hmm. Just if you see, uh, just in terms of where the jokes were landing, for example, Correct. or how well they were landing, or just how nicely they had opened up the character of Pete Holmes, hmm. uh, or the fact that you had just begin to really, really, uh, you know, empathize or you were invested in the character of Pete Holmes to want to see what happens next. So, I mean, in fact, there's already talk about how they are considering taking the, the story to another network hmm. because they feel that they do have more episodes to tell about this man's life. Hmm. So I don't know if I'll be able to say with that much surety that, oh, you know, I think we got the perfect story and there's nothing else left to be told. That we'll only be able to tell once we see what they have in store. But uh, Crashing, I feel, is a show that everybody who's listening in should check out. Because it gets so much of New York, right? Mm. It's good to get so much of the New York. And you know how much Anirudh and I love shows based in New York. New right? York. I mean, just listen to our previous episodes, guys. You'll get a sense of the that. The New York comedy scene too, in fact, yeah. uh, is something that we've seen in earlier uh, American shows. Uh, whether it's a Louis uh, or even in Seinfeld, that was his job. At the end of the day, he was a stand-up comic. So Crashing does all of that. You know, it sort of gives you an insight into the comedy club scene a lot of our friends Ashish Shakya for example was talking about how it gets the entire comedy scene right correct because for those not familiar with the comedy scene and I'm and I'm not saying that Anirudh and I any authorities on it but we do have a lot of friends who are within this space you know comedy and stand up is not just about going out there and delivering the funny lines right it's firstly about understanding your space what is your comedy what kind of comedian you are and what works for you and your audience and what doesn't then it's about writing that material because often jokes that sound hilarious in your head may actually translate to absolutely nothing when you're delivering them out loud then it's to get the opportunity I mean Pete Holmes crashing at multiple comedians and you know other friends is home it's sort of to say that you know it's also a business which doesn't pay off very easily in the beginning it's about like doing a lot of free gigs a lot of warming up for other more famous comedians or even at you know maybe at children's birthday parties god knows but until a point where you have proved your metal enough to now start getting paid for it so I feel like if you know I'm not saying that it's exactly the same as the Indian scenario but crashing is a pretty good appetizer of what to expect if you're going to get into the comedy scene. Yeah, yeah. It also gives you and uh, uh, an interesting perspective into the life of a comedian. Yeah. Like you said, I mean, the same material that might be a super hit on one uh, at one show 
might completely bomb with a different set of and people. And we've seen that with so many of our comedian friends, right? I mean, they're doing a great a set that they might have done, which might have had the audience like holding their stomachs and laughing out loud. The same set may actually not work with a different audience at all. You're probably being looked at like, "Ye kaun sa joke mara yaar tumne?" Right, and there's also the 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 bit about how you've got to keep owning your skill. Hmm. Uh, so I think. Beyond a point, crashing really is a show about artists. Yeah, you know he comes in contact with so many people who are in different stages of their career. Either they've completely made it and are super successful, or they've been doing it for a long amount of time and had reached some form of fame, but were still unhappy. Hmm. Or there were people who had, uh, you know, who are not in it for the fame itself. They just loved getting up in the morning and going to the comedy clubs and doing something that they really enjoyed doing so we discover this world of comedy through the eyes of feet homes who's a sort of an outsider he lives across the bridge yeah. is forced to uh, you know sort of settle in manhattan because uh, like you said his wife throws him out of the house and uh, and you know we see the entire Journey. comedy scene through his eyes we see him evolve as a human being over Correct. a period like, of time you know, of and my... we also see his art evolve over a period of time one of my favorite scenes in crashing is i think in season 3 uh, when he another female comedian and there's a very senior comedian who's known for cracking sexes jokes are on the road together and um, by the end of it you know there's this very subtle but very very like you know impactful comment made on the sexism within the comedy scene as well because for years we've also talked about like how comedy needs to evolve beyond just cracking jokes about women and male relationships or about the most obvious things especially where often women are at the center of that right you're talking about women cooking you talk about women in the kitchen you talk about women coming in and taking over these spaces i love the fact there that the female comedian now who in 2018 because this i think was like this came out in 2018 is sort of evolved enough to understand that this kind of bullshit shit comedy does not work anymore calls out the sexist comedian and Pete Holmes who's still figuring out you know what space whether he should kind of you know do where he the, stands on it yeah where he stands on it has to sort of make that call and he sees the sexist comedian for the shitty sort of space he's gone on to grow in for all these years also uh, it has a bunch of great cameos arty lang who's this comedian plays arty lang on the show mm. pete homes in fact plays a version of himself a fictionalized version of himself called pete but my favorite episode i remember i mean in terms of a cameo from a famous comedian is an episode where i think in the second or third episode where you where he's literally very new to the scene he ends up crashing at tj miller's house yeah, yeah. and tj miller is playing this slightly uh, hyper sort of fictional version of himself hmm. and he finds out that uh, pete's wife is essentially selling away all his old furniture because she wants to make space in the house without him <laughs> and tj miller being tj miller the superstar comedian living in this beautiful condo in new york where pete homes has crashed says that nothing doing he clears his schedule for the day and he lands up in brooklyn to <laughs> argue and fight with the wife and to make sure that pete gets some of the things that are dear to him even though he's just met him less than 24 hours ago yeah so it it's just a great writing it's a great characterization and crashing is a show that's out on hotstar and i think everybody should watch it because it's a show just that just keeps getting better with every episode And on that note let's take another quick break on the other side we're going to talk about another show that we love it's called Love Sick Do you wish you were smarter Well so do we but the next best thing we could make you sound smarter and to help you with this endeavor we are simplified <laughs> a podcast uh, that attempts to break down the complex world around you with a little knowledge a lot of poor jokes and a ton of random trivia episodes out every monday on the ivm podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts see ya welcome back we are talking about easy peasy viewings and the next show on the agenda is a netflix show called love sick now this is a british show uh, and it has one of the most interesting setups for a show ever hmm. it begins with our protagonist dylan hmm. finding out that he has chlamydia now all of those who are above the age of 18 and are sexually active if you don't know what chlamydia is my children please google JFGI as you would say once upon a time and I'm JFGI if you don't know what JFGI is please google that also life will give you one you tight slap You are auntie google that's who you are <laughs> 
But so essentially Dylan finds out he has chlamydia and he essentially so the first episode has him sitting down with his best friend Luke and they put together a list of all the women he slept with uh since he found out that he had chlamydia or in the period that was possible during which any one of them could have gotten chlamydia from him uh and each episode essentially begins with the name of a character of essentially one of the girls he dated at different points of time now this is primarily the setup hmm. right and it essentially opens up doors to explore how the same kind of a guy can have different kinds of relationships with several different kinds of girls chlamydia is also the reason that the show originally was called scrotal recall was it that was was that what it's called wasn't it how could you have known that unless you googled it ani you told me yeah so it was called you just killed my joke there it was originally called scrotal recall oh there was a punch line coming i should have waited now scrotal please Auntie continue google had one more piece of trivia to <laughs> please share. continue it's okay how do I'm you like to this. how do you like the nickname aunty google by the way i like it i love it please okay. call me aunty google find me as aunty google in all your comments Chal. at janisek 85 hashtag aunty google hashtag aunty google rocks With a Z. Okay, moving on. Um, With a Z? Yeah, like R O K Z. No. <laughs> okay, we've spent too much time on this, but uh, essentially, love sick. What makes love sick great is the fact that uh, once you are familiar with the entire trope of. this guy getting in touch with several girls and telling them about the fact that he has chlamydia and sort of hence taking an episodic approach where in every episode you get to see a new sort of a romance affair what you want to call it hmm. so like most uh, sitcom like shows which have these uh, you know 20 something boys and girls going about their relationships and that kind of a show has sort of had various iterations over years you know there was friends in the 90s there was how i met your mother in the 2000s there have been several others since lovesick at the end of the day goes beyond this very simple premise of a guy with chlamydia and sort of really tells the story of these four characters right so there's dylan the lead character we spoke about his really interesting friend luke best thing about the show is luke who we will talk about in a in a little bit but he's essentially an updated or uh, and a really more likable version of barney stinson in my opinion uh, less uh, in your face also yeah and uh, and there's the character of evie the best friend uh, who at the end of the day you know sort of turns into some sort of a love angle for dylan uk I know what Janice wants to say. She wants to say that a girl and a boy can't be friends. I can just tell these things about you, Janice. I can tell that expression. I can see that you want to just let it out. And the f- and the fourth friend, Angus, who incidentally Evie had some sort of a history with in the past, but is this really creepy, weird friend who also lives with uh, you know over a period of time comes to live with these three people. So yeah, it's it it starts off in a in a sort of a very weird sort of. setting and then moves into the lives of these four people so the thing is that dilin is my least favorite of the four characters that you've just mentioned right because if you look at it um dilin is actually just like you know he's that guy who's never sure about anything he wants commitment but yet when it comes down to commitment is not going to commit he thinks he's in love with pretty much any woman he slept with and ultimately when it comes down to him realizing who could be the true the, the true love of his life he fails even at that so for me through the multiple seasons even though dilin is the main lead i feel like you know other characters like especially luke luke like you know who you described as barney stinson luke to me is really the anchor of the show like he but really isn't that a sort of a classic uh, uh, even in uh, since you spoke about it even on how i met your mother if you think about it ted mosby is the most confused guy of the lot correct so actually dilin and ted mosby have a lot in common. I mean, they probably need to have a drink together and figure out what their life issues are. Because <laughs> even on how I met your mother, I really never took to Ted Mosby. I was like, "Ye bande ka problem kya? He's just never happy. If a girl likes him, he's confused about him. If the girl doesn't like him, he's like, 'Why doesn't she love me? Why doesn't she like me?' And you know, Ani, the truth is. All us women have met a Ted Mosby or a Dylan in our lives. Right. Like you know these guys who are just confused and eventually I mean also what's really like you know interesting to me is that Luke as you said is an updated version but he's also a lot more sensitive version of Barney Stinson because his own journey within the right. show and the women he's sort of in love with or has been in love with uh, the way he deals with that relationship the kind of commitment that he puts himself out there with i really like luke i mean luke yeah, was yeah. a real discovery and then of course there is evie 
Uh, her name is not Evie, you guys. Her name is Evie. That's how every character on the show pronounces it. Evie is lovable. I mean, she's just she's lovely. She's, she's adorable. She's warm. She's smart. She knows what she wants. Uh, again, you know, I feel like I empathized with Evie so much because. Ladies, you know, we've all been there. We've all been pining after a guy who's just like, we're waiting for him to wake up and say like, you know, drink some coffee. I'm right here. Yeah, yeah. But no, you honey, know, I'm not talking about you. We <laughs> ended up together. Obviously, there's no problem with you. So I started off as a Dylan, but I ended up being a Luke. Is that what uh, no, you're saying? No, baby. No, no, no. We'll neither. talk about our real life issues oh, okay, like later. Okay, fine. Later. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think uh, taking the How I Met Your Mother conversation a little bit ahead, you're absolutely right. It's a slightly more updated and more nuanced and better version of a show of the kind of show How I Met Your Mother could have ever been. Because In fact, I, I feel like it sometimes reminds me of this other show that you and I love, uh, New Girl. Right. I mean, you loved Jess. Yeah, in terms of the setup, three guys, one girl living together. But I think now that we speak about it more, uh, I think it has more parallels with How I Met Your Mother in terms of the relationship of Ted with Robin Probably. and Ted with Barney. But I think uh, what makes the show work as opposed to a How I Met Your Mother, which I feel would not have aged as well, is the fact that, for example, the, the character of Luke, like you said, is not just an asshole. Hmm. In the sense that he's an extremely charming, handsome, has a way with the ladies guy, but he's a person who's somewhere empty inside. Correct. You know, he also has had heartbreaks, which he's found difficult to get over. Uh, he's a complex character. And that's what I like about the show is that even a Dylan, who, like you pointed out, might seem boring on other shows, over a period of time, you, you're you able to really understand why Dylan is the way he is, why Luke is the way he is, why Evie is the way she is. No I one can in, explain Angus's behavior though. <laughs> Angus is like, you no, know, but even Angus, you know, so Angus is this fourth character on the show who starts off being this sort of a comic relief. But over a period of time, even he, I mean, there's this one really heartbreaking moment in in a, in season three, and and that's got to do with Angus. So I think uh, what Lovesick does really well is that it balances comedy mm. with emotion in a manner that is very fluid. You know, it it never stops being light, or it never really gets heavy or intense, but. It speaks about some really uh, heavy and intense issues. Yeah. In fact, my favorite track across three seasons has been uh, has been the one that involves a character called Abigail, who is not part of the principal cast, but had a recurring uh, part to play. Mm. Uh, and is the love triangle between Dylan, uh, Abigail and Evie, uh, where you have established Dylan and Evie's relationship to a point where as an audience, you really want them to get together. But at the same time, Dylan is seeing this other girl called Abigail and mm. she's been sketched out so well. And Dylan and Abigail's scenes are so nice and so heartwarming that even when you know that Dylan has to make that tough choice and, you know, just break it to Abigail and you want him to get with Evie, you know that you're going to be as heartbroken for Abigail. Yeah, I mean, Abigail is that girl that, uh, you know, she's sorted, she's funny, she's pretty, she's witty, and yet she's not that girl who... She's you know, not the, Evie. No, no, she's not that girl who, you know, there are girls who are pretty, confident, witty, and they know it. Abigail is not that. She doesn't know it. The audience knows it, which is why we're rooting for, which is why you're right. When Dylan, you know, sort of, he has to make that choice between Abigail and Evie, it is heartbreaking because you're like, she's so sorted. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, what's also frustrating for me when I was watching this track was that at the point that they sort of brought this in, they didn't actually show us, or at least I felt like Dylan didn't seem to have as strong a feeling for Evie, which has actually been my one small niggling issue with the show is that maybe it's also because I just don't like Dylan much as a character, <laughs> but I just genuinely feel like I'm seeing Evie's emotions. I'm seeing the sacrifices that she has made. I feel like Dylan is constantly copping out. But I think that's got to do with the fact that as characters, uh, Evie has always loved Dylan uh, from the beginning, yeah. consistently over a period of time. And has only really dated other people because Dylan has never really been available. Dylan sort of develops feelings for Evie during the course of the show. 
but you know what he was saying that you know Abigail actually is the perfect person in every way in terms you know she's an she's an extremely secure girlfriend she i mean secure as secure as a girlfriend could be who with with a guy whose best friend is a girl and who uh, she knows that the girl uh, probably has yeah, uh, feelings has feelings for, for. Uh, she's an extremely intelligent witty a warm person so she is right for dylan in many ways but she's just not ev you know you are so invested in uh, it's it's like they are the ross and rachel of the show uh, whatever else they might do and wherever else the show might go in future you just know that you want ev and dylan to be together in some form or the other at the end of the day but you know my favorite uh, episode from the show actually was not an episode that it featured either i mean it, it featured them but it wasn't based on ev and dylan's romance or even you know dylan's uh, various other ex girlfriends and women he slept with it was actually luke's episode if you remember that there's this episode uh, where um, you know dylan is dated a girl called phoebe who actually seems perfect for luke yeah, in every yeah. way and they're at a bar quiz and you know luke and phoebe are killing it yeah. but luke never pursues phoebe because he feels like you know bros come bro before code. Yeah. bro code yeah bros come before all else and then about 6 months or a year later they go hunting for phoebe because of course dylan wants to find out if he possibly got chlamydia from phoebe and it turns out that phoebe's no more and luke's entire sort of reaction and the way he deals with it and the sorrow that he feels of course the regret that he feels that he never went after someone who could have been possibly perfect for him and maybe he'd been in a long relationship with that sort of never works out it was a great great episode yeah and that like that is a perfect example of a slightly sort of a darkish or rather a more you know sort of life theme interspersed into a show that's just supposed to be uh, really light and frothy correct yeah. it's also also i mean we've spoken a, a lot about the romance and we've spoken a lot about the friendship and guys the laughs just flow beautifully this is at the end of the day it's british wit at its best yeah. uh, it reminded <laughs> me of some really funny shows that we've watched whether it was catastrophe uh, or whether it was also the other crashing yeah, which phoebe the- waller bridge wrote back in the day uh, and you know it's just it's a laugh a minute you know it's filled with just observations about relationships about friendships about what it means for like even like you know if you're a friends fan you know where you've had monica and rachel living in one house and joey and chandler living in the opposite house this again gives you that feeling as well because at the end of the day your your central characters are pretty much living with each other all the time so that leads to a lot of moments as well but yeah i mean this this is a feel good show um you know we started off saying that easy peasy viewing is a show that you generally can sort of you know watch also as lunch time break or when you're traveling and yes you know first season of love sick is true in that format and that sense but as the second and third season evolve i feel like you need to watch the show non stop or at least maybe 3 4 episodes at a time to get a sense of where the story is moving right. because that's when they really start dealing with matters of the heart and you know other sort of complications that enter like again one of the things that we've not spoken about yet is the insecurities that Luke starts to feel when he realizes that his two best friends are getting together. That's beautiful. That's in so many friendships, right? Like there's a trio and you're all three besties. Suddenly two people in that trio decide to say, "Hey, we want to be together." What happens to the third person? Yeah, yeah, and that's a very interesting way to look at it. And in fact, all the three shows we spoke about today, Love Crashing and Love Sick, are shows that probably and the reason they made it to this episode is that they all started out as being simple ideas which were probably fun to watch but over a period of time hmm. and instantly both have had three season runs of course love and crashing is not coming back love season the season 4 is in the works in the sense that uh, the actors are very interested to come back but they've all gotten busy love-sick. with other stuff this is yeah. love sick hmm. so while there is uh, there is hope of a season 4 it's not been officially greenlit because the actors are actually really busy with other yeah, projects i mean if, they've gotten so popular ki unke paas abhi time nahi yeah, hai to come a, back on the show that made them popular right but but all three shows essentially go beyond being just easy peasy viewing uh, you know sort of TV shows and have evolved into really smart, intelligent sort of rom coms, dramedies, and they're all three very different genres. While love is very strictly a sort of a relationship drama, crashing is is a dramedy, and love sick is really a romantic comedy in in its most basic form. Actually, I'm going to just correct you on your definition of love sick. I feel like love sick at the heart of it is a story of friendship. 
Really it is. I mean, you look at the three characters or the four characters and you look at what they've done over three seasons. It's really about but friendship. But you know, while, more I, than love, while, more I agree, than while I would have agreed with you on that uh, a couple of seasons ago, for me now, the most lasting factor hmm. of lovesick has been the romance between Evie and Dylan, which while it starts off being, you know, just another, you know, two best friends sort of bonding together and you feel that it'll go down a cliched route. I think the writers have taken some very bold choices and have been able to make their relationship what anchors the show. Right. So that was uh, essentially easy peasy viewing shows. All these shows are available on different streaming networks. So Love, Love is on Netflix. Crashing is on Hotstar. And Lovesick is again on Netflix. And uh, if you tell us what you thought of these shows. If you've already watched these shows, find us on our social media platforms and leave comments and let us know whether you agree with our views on these shows. If you don't agree with our views, feel free to share that as well. And if you have examples of other similar easy peasy viewing shows, please uh, write to both uh, Janice and me on Twitter and Instagram. We are both at Janisek85 on Twitter and Instagram and at Anigo on Twitter and Instagram. And if you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or ivmpodcast.com. You can also follow us on social media. We are IVM podcast on Twitter and Instagram. And if you reach out to me, as I said, Ani Guha and Janisek85 on Twitter and Instagram. And we'll be back next week with more Mr. and Mrs. Binge Watch. Look, up in the internet, it's a meme. No, it's a cat video. No, it's the Geek Fruit Podcast. That's right. We interrupt this riveting broadcast to tell you about our show, The Geek Fruit Podcast, where Tejas, Dinkar, and I, Jishnu, talk about everything in pop culture, including DC, Marvel, Star Wars, Netflix, and everything in between. You know how your friends hate it when you ramble about some nerdy crap and you just want somebody to listen to you? Well, sorry, there's nothing we can do about that, but come listen to us ramble and it'll almost be like the real thing. Kind of. Listen to new episodes of the Geek Fruit Podcast every Monday and the Geek Fruit Bulletin every Thursday on iTunes, Google Podcasts, the IVM app, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Happy listening, you nerds. Filter coffee is a fascinating beverage. You need to pick the right beans, blend them in the right proportion, roast them to perfection and slow brew at the right temperature to get the perfect cup. Which is exactly like great conversations as well. You need to track down the most interesting minds, get them into their zone, and settle down for an unhurried, unscripted chat. And coffee for me is always, always, always best enjoyed with friends. I'm Karthik Nagarajan, and do share my table as I meet some of the most interesting people I know and sit them down for a strong cup of coffee and an even stronger conversation. Join me every Wednesday for a freshly brewed episode. This is not Frappe. This is the Filter Coffee Podcast. Podcast.